next talk is given by Jacques Lain. Um, inviting me to speak here. And uh, I feel maybe I should also apologize because this might be the first talk this morning without DC bias versus injunction. And uh, it's the first time, I mean, we always work with DC bias versus injunction. So it's also maybe doubly apologize because now this is the first experiment uh, that we've done where I'll, I'll present some kind of unbiased Joseph's injunction. So uh, the topic is um, topological circuits. So it's, it's, it's more on topo topology. And um, so this work was um, done by uh, Leo Perusha, who's a student in my group. And it's, it's kind of ideas that uh, arose, um, you know, with my first student, Joël, and then uh, we developed with uh, postdoc Jean Damien. And then, um, so it's a work that, um, this is gonna be experimental work with some lots of theory for us to understand what topology means and how to, how to realize it in Joseph's injunctions. And uh, so uh, I'd like to thank the, gr the whole group and uh, especially um, uh, Jean-Louis Smir and Ramiro who helped a lot with experiments and then we had a lot of help um, to understand the theory with uh, Raphael Leon, uh, Vala Fatemi, Landry Breto, and Anton Aknarov. <coughs> so, uh, so this is kind of uh, for the last, I'd say, maybe 15, 20 years. Every time we have a talk about topology, except maybe Wolfgang's, we didn't see some donuts. So. Um, the topology is kind of, yeah, we have a continuous deformation of some objects and yet we have an invariant, uh, something discrete which doesn't change. Okay, so here it's the number of holes. You can transform your donuts and uh, as long as you don't scrunch it up completely, you still have a hole. So that's your invariant. And uh, so w I would always see presentations about these donuts and then suddenly we go into some complicated theory of, uh, of the invariants, uh, uh, some you know, geometric theory, so quite elegant, but kind of uh, you know, much more mathematically involved than the donut. So I think there are examples of very physical donuts where you do have some topology, and this is, this is just the um, flux quantization in a superconducting ring. So you can see this as a real donut where if you field cool it, you can trap a uh, quantized flux. And if you change the, if you deform this donut, you still, you, you, you keep the same number of flux, quanta. It's just that the current in the loop will, will change. And if you imagine scrunching this uh, donut completely, well, you, you exceed the critical current uh, and then you have no more flux trap in your loop. Okay, so, you know, it's, this is kind of the physical consequence of, a, of a, a, you know, equivalent to basically removing the hole from your, edible donut. And I think Shapiro's steps, uh, and what we've seen is also a, a, a case of topology where we can lock on to different steps, at, uh, different values of an integer. And these, thing, this, these steps are insensitive to the, you know, the, the, in some large range to EJ, to thermal noise and so on. So I think there are examples like this of topology which are maybe much older than what we're used to uh, in, in recent times, but which are quite, uh, quite robust. These are, these are very robust phenomena. And what's very interesting with topology is that since we have something that's discrete and that doesn't depend on physical parameters, in some sense it can only depend on fundamental constants. If you have an uh, electrical system, for example, then you know, you're limited to, you know, here's the, the fundamental, you, know, you have the electric charge and you have H bar and you can, and you can make these quantities which have a physical interpretation and so this metrology triangle kind of gives you what transport quantities you can expect to quantize. Okay, so more recently, I mean, this is the kind of topology that we've been excited about recently, and it's quite new. And um, so, and as we've seen, it arises not from the physical sample, such as a, as a superconducting ring, but here it's kind of the, the, the geometry of the manifold of of the, the Hilbert space and the, the energy structure. So here we have kind of the, the band structure for a uh, material with some spin-orbit coupling. And it turns out, depending on 
what kind of material. If we have strong spin orbit coupling, we can get uh, what are called the topological insulators that we've seen about already. And we can also get these um, whale semi-metals or Dirac semi-metals. And so you can see that uh, they have a quite um, kind of uh, very distinct spectral signatures. And these signatures have been measured with photo emission. OK. So this is kind of, I would say, uh, you know, spectral proof of non-trivial topology in real physical uh, you know, condensed matter systems. OK. And so um, you know, this topology is supposed to be protected. We're supposed to see some very robust, for example, transport phenomena. And, and the quantum Hall effect is a very good example where we can have extremely robust quantization. But then, you know, with some of these other newer materials, I mean, it seems that it's less precise. We don't have such good quantization. And then uh, the signatures, the transport signatures can even be ambiguous. And this is because we have many different phenomena that can also occur. And so the question is, yeah, so I think, I don't know, there's some, I've, I've some at least frustration from the experimentalist part where we were led to believe some of these states should be quite robust, but in practice they're not. So, so the question is, oh, something happened to my so slide, but the question is uh, what makes this topological state robust or not? And I think it has to do with uh, you know, the role of the thermal, the thermal excitations. And then I think the most important is this H junk that I got from uh, Frank Wilhelm's presentation yesterday. You can always have terms in your Hamiltonian that you don't know about. And these can open kind of gaps in your spectrum and, uh, re and ruin your, your uh, topological protection. OK. So, um, so for solids, for real solids, you know, material fabrication is difficult. It's hard to synthesize these materials. They're sensitive to disorder. The topological phase might not be robust. You know, there are many other terms in your Hamiltonian H junk that you forget about. And so the idea is, can we do it with superconducting systems? So this is something that um, uh, people have looked at more recently. And so th they, you know, w they're well understood. They're coherent. We can make precise measurements in superconducting circuits. And so this, I think, was the inspiration for all of our work, was work on realizing that you could map kind of these whale semi-metals to multi-terminal Josephson junction systems, where you can get a very similar spectrum, and then and Wolfgang talked about that uh, previously. And so th the problem with these systems is they're also a bit difficult to implement when we're using uh, um, non-tunnel weak links. Uh, you know, this is, you have to make the dimensions quite small. Uh, the the uh, junctions have to be very close together. We have to have a few channels. These channels have to have high transmission. So this is also quite difficult to realize experimentally. And so the question was to go from multi-terminal SNS systems with Andrea bound states, small normal weak links, to um, tunnel junctions and see you know, how can we get some, can we obtain kind of a similar s spectra, topological spectra in um, just tunnel junction based systems. OK. So, um, so that's the first question will be, can we make like a topologically non-trivial Josephson tunnel junction circuit, and then uh, are there signs that are not ambiguous? Can we obtain a, a really clear sign that it is different topologically? And then is this, are these topological states robust? So that's kind of the questions that I'd like to, to kind of uh, try to answer. So, um, so we've seen the Josephson junction um, in all the talks this morning. Um, we have the, the charging energy. and um, if we consider just the charging energy, we get these, um, this type of spectrum in, in the charge basis where we have these uh, displaced parabolas. And NG is the gate charge. And uh, as soon as we have some non-zero coupling between the charge states with the Josephson element, we open up uh, a gap in the spectrum. OK, so this is kind of a trivial gap. OK, so if we now, let's, let's, let's try to find a topological Josephson junction circuit in the simplest way. So we just start adding now a junction. We, we now have a squid. We went from one junction to two. We have a squid. And here, 
uh, now we have uh, some additional parameter. So this is kind of uh, the first parameter we get that we can tune experimentally in addition to the gate charge, which is the flux in the loop, phi x. And so uh, we can rewrite the Hamiltonian and we have this, um, you know, we can rewrite it in this way where we, we sum, we, we do a sum in the, in the complex plane of EJL and EJR and we have this phase factor. And uh, so if we actually make the squid totally symmetric, as you all know, we can actually uh, tune out this Josephson element and we can obtain uh, kind of uh, degeneracies at phi x equals pi, okay? And so this we can, we can interpret, uh, you know, so, and if we make the junction, if we make the squid asymmetric, so here we've added 20% Josephson energy to the left junction, to the right junction, uh, we see that we, we then l uh, open up a gap again. And since trivially, since when we fabricate a squid, we will always have some disorder in the fabrication, we'll always open up a gap. Okay, so this, this factor here, we can, we can factor out uh, this term here, and then what we have is just this geometric kind of uh, representation where we, we add a vector to uh, a unit vector along the, the real axis. And, and the, the thing is, if we can, if we can close this uh, kind of, we can close this structure on itself, this, this vector, we can get back to zero, then we have a degeneracy. Okay, so it has a very simple geometric interpretation. Uh, but the problem is that um, K is never exactly one. So to be able to, to, to construct and get this vector sum, which gets back to zero, we'd have to have k equal to one. This is always kind of lifted. Uh, so what we do, uh, what we did is just to, um, just to add a single junction. So this is what we call the bi-squid. So it's, you can see it as uh, you know, a squid, two squids, or a, um, uh, or a tunable squid, if you wish. But now we have two parameters, or well, three in total, so the gate charge, and then the two fluxes, phi L and phi R, which, can, which control now, um, kind of add an extra dimension towards this uh, sum that we can make, okay? There, so now we have, there we have the KL, KR, which will be fixed when we fabricate the sample, and then we have the two phases. Okay, so as you, you can imagine, so this gives you now the possibility to create triangles. So here in the case of a symmetric bi-squid where all junctions are equal, we can construct this triangle in this fashion. And uh, if you calculate the, the energy, the, the energy dispersion, so this is that we fix the NG to 0 0.5 and look at the energy um, diagram as a function of the two fluxes, you actually, you get uh, what we saw before for the whale semi-metal. And if you, um, you know, now if you, if you make a cut along NG at these degeneracy points, you actually see that, you know, you have, you've effectively uh, eliminated the Josephson part from the whole circuit, and it looks just like a, um, a pure capacitor. Okay. And why are there two degeneracies? That's also quite clear geometrically, because you can close, if you fix the length of the, of these two, um, the, uh, the, the three sides of the triangle, you can actually close it in two ways. You know, you can, you can go around like this or around like this, and that will give you the two degeneracies in the phase space. Okay, so, and again, if you now vary the parameters, say you fabricate your sample, of course it's not symmetric, you, can, you see that you can still close the triangle because uh, you know, as long as KL plus KR, the magnitudes, are larger than one, then you can, you can close this triangle, okay? And so as you change the, the parameters for the, the Josephson junctions, the Josephson energies, you end up uh, uh, kind of moving around the, the positions of these degeneracies, but they're not lifted until you approach this critical point uh, where you end up getting kind of a, of a, a quadratic crossing, yes? Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so that's, this is the case where we're on the topologically trivial 
region where we have no, no gap in the spectrum. Okay, so you end up getting this uh, phase diagram, which is, is quite neat, where we have this um, topological region, a large region, and then if we make the sample too asymmetric, then we come out of this region. Okay, so topological region, it can be seen as where we can close this triangle, and then uh, the critical regime is when we have kind of a flat line, and then uh, here we're in the gap space. Okay. So I will skip this. Okay. So um, so people have looked a lot at the uh, topological properties of, um, or exploited the topological properties of similar circuits using jo with Josephson junctions for a long time. Um, one of the one of the possible phenomena is this um, is charge pumping, and so I think we've worked on charge pumping for quite a while now, but it's still not at the point where the quantization is um, high enough or w good enough for um, for applications. And I think you know we've proposed ourselves a, a different circuit in which one could actually uh, make an equivalent of a transconductance quantization. So it's a more complicated circuit where you could imagine closing this metrological triangle just with Josephson junctions. But again, this is these are uh, this would be a difficult transport experiment, and so um, uh, we felt that it would be better just to to try to measure these these degeneracies with spectroscopy. And again, this degeneracy this is an intrinsic topological property of the system. It's not one that's induced by say some drive. Okay, so. Uh, so the idea is to do microwave spectroscopy and try to detect these, uh, to get some evidence of band crossings. And so what we did was a, was a conventional microwave spectroscopy uh, measurement where we couple the bisquid to a, uh, an oscillator and then look at the uh, dispersive shift. Uh, the coupling uh, to the, to the bisquid gives you some shift in the resonant frequency which will also depend on the occupation of the, um, the level occupation of the state of the bisquid. Okay, and so, uh, and then what we can do is we can try to excite the transition. So this is a cut along the diagonal direction in the, in the phase, in the energy diagram where we have the two degeneracies. So these are the two degeneracies. And then the idea will be to try to excite this transition and then see the, the shift uh, uh, so we can probe that by squid transition. Okay, so uh, the model we use, uh, the, model, the model we use, I think, will be discussed later. So Park et al. Uh, in, in this session, in the, maybe I think tomorrow. But the idea is to um, expand because we're, we're weakly coupled. We can expand in the char in the voltage fluctuations in the resonator, and then we can actually trace back the uh, shift in the resonator frequency to the energy levels of the bisquid. Okay. All right, so uh, at first we just measured a squid just to make sure everything uh, was working fine. So if you have a squid, you know, if you, the, you can try to make it as symmetric as possible. So, you know, here I think this will be, uh, you know, 5% asymmetry. And so you expect kind of a gap spectrum, but which comes pretty close to a degeneracy. And if you consider kind of the uh, the two the the resonator level and then the transition you know it, we expect it to come very close to uh, zero in energy and so if you look at the 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 resonator shift then you'll see that you get this kind of uh, picture here so depending on whether in you're in the zero or one state okay so the main limitation though to all of these techniques I mean to spectroscopy in this way is that uh, the two-tone frequency shift actually vanishes at the at degeneracy. Okay, so uh, from the start, I mean, spectroscopy is quite powerful, but it turns out in these systems you can't uh, you can't excite the the transition, and and that's kind of obvious because you're killing the Josephson part, which allows you to actually couple the charge states. So you're you're killing that coupling, so you can't actually uh, make the, um, drive the transition. So we'll be able to. S Measure near the near the degeneracy, but we won't be able to get there. Okay, so here's the um, the what the samples look like. So this is the resonator, uh, coplanar waveguide resonator, 
it's a, we use the lambda mode and we will we'll put the um, so basically uh, uh, we'll drive uh, at the resonator frequency and measure the shift in the resonator frequency and uh, from this shift we can extract kind of the, the energy levels of the bisquid and these are the typical parameters we have in our experiment. Okay, so um, so where do we where do we put the the bi squid or the squid? So this is first. I'll I'll show what what happens with the squid. So we put the squid at the center of the line. So here you can see uh, this is the squid right here. It's it's coupled near the. This is the center of the coplanar waveguide, uh, and then we have a flux line nearby. So wait. Let me focus first of all. Yeah, here's the uh, here's the squid with the two junctions here, and then this is where we apply our flux, and uh, it's a small junction. So, and um, and of course we have an additional line here, so we can uh, we can both excite the transition and also apply the uh, the phase phi x. Okay, so we we sent, we inject we inject uh, the DC and the AC excitation through this line. Okay, so if we do now, uh, in this sample, we do a one tone, we sweep the gate voltage, uh, and uh, what we would expect to see is kind of um, when the, uh, the transition for the squid is above the resonator, we get kind of a, a negative shift here in the, in the phase and then uh, we get a positive shift when we're on the other side. Okay, and, but in, so, and that we can fit very well with our model. And however, when we do this, of course, we see that uh, we have, you know, it's not the charge, we have some charge noise, and then we can, we can uh, calibrate that out. We can, um, uh, you know, we can correct for the, there's slow drift and there's some jumps, and we can discard measurements when there are jumps and uh, correct the, the voltage so that we can correct for drift. And so um, once we've done this automatic calibration, then kind of we can get a, 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 a nice data for, to correct for the gate voltage um, fluctuation. And so here we now do the two-tone uh, two excitation and you see uh, kind of this um, a decrease, you know, we, we approach uh, a small transition when we get to ng equals 0 0.5. Okay, so here's uh, some data with the with the background removed, and you can see kind of we can we can fit these lines over here, which correspond to the um, to the squid transitions. And if I mean the interesting part is down here, and you can see that we we lose our signal as we approach this uh, this small gap, uh, and if we just uh, we, we can we can see that here you know there's a faint line that's going down here, and um, and again the the uh, the problem is that near as we get to degeneracy this matrix element connecting the two states vanishes. Okay, so uh, if we just go down here and integrate for a very long time, uh, then we can kind of obtain uh, we can obtain the position for this transition as a function of the of the current. And here we see that, um, uh, you know, within our model, within what we can fit, you know, here is the fit if we assumed it was perfectly symmetric. And uh, within our model, we can, we can say that, you know, this is basically 5% asymmetry between the two junctions. Okay, so I'll get now very quickly. So this, the bi-squid, this is the interesting part. So here's what the uh, bi-squid looks like. So we now have three junctions, okay? So three junctions are here. Uh, two loops, and then we have uh, two, two lines now to be able to independently uh, flux bias each of the loops. And so it's a slightly more complicated setup. And, um, and here's, so what we expect is that uh, we should be able to have these two kinds of distinct uh, excitation spectra, okay? So this is the transition energy in the two, in the gapped and the topological regime. And so you can see, I mean, very qualitatively, uh, you know, here we have kind of this, in, uh, the curvature is different near pi, and then we have the degeneracies for the topological region. Okay, so I will skip 
through the, some of the details, but we have quasi-particle poisoning. So when we measure, we see two quasi-particle states. We managed to get uh, rid of this. Uh, so, okay, so here's like a, a trace where we see the uh, quasi-particle poisoning. We managed to um, get rid of this for, our, for some of our samples with gap engineering. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we, have, we, we haven't yet obtained a bisquid device where, we can, where we, we've been able to get rid of quasi-particles. So what we have to do is, um, you know, we, have, we can see both the quasi-particle states. And so we have to, you know, this is what you would get if you just did a raw trace. And we have to actually select for the quasi-particle states so we can uh, clean up this data and, and get some, uh, some meaningful spectra. Okay, so here's a device uh, which is uh, in the gapped regime, first of all. And so in the gapped regime, what we expect is basically the, um, we have one minima here in the, in the excitation energy. So this is, you can see like the minimum excitation energy doesn't go to zero. And uh, when we measure the two-tone spectra for this sample, you, can, you clearly see that we have, this is the region where this is analogous to the squid where we have a, a gapped spectrum at pi. Now, if we uh, cr produce now, we fabricate another device, the junctions are more symmetric, and now we expect to be in the topological regime. And uh, what, we, what we see is now we have, we should have two points here in the, two, trend, two points in the phase space where the transition energy is zero. And so this is the data for this sample, and we clearly see kind of this, um, Near pi, we see the inverted, the, the negative curvature on the, uh, for the transition. And then we have um, kind of the, uh, the, the rest of this whale cone that we can see as we move away uh, from pi for pi L equals pi R. Okay, we can create, uh, we can fabricate another junction again. And we see this, this one is uh, less symmetric. So you can see that the, the degeneracies start to approach each other, and then, uh, we, but we still have this region of neg negative curvature. Okay, so we have this regime where we have positive curvature, and this corresponds to a gapped by squid, and then we have this regime uh, with negative curvature. So even though we, you know, because of um, experimental difficulties, we couldn't approach. The, uh, the degeneracy point as close as we would like, but you can, you can clearly see this qualitative, uh, this, quanti this qualitative feature, which is this negative curvature that you can actually resolve quite clearly, which is, uh, which is indicative of this topological regime. Okay, so, uh, so this, is, uh, you know, this is a distinct signature of this regime, and you could even, um, you know, if you gave me a sample like this and, uh, or gave my student and asked him, okay, I don't know what the symmetry of the junctions are, measure and tell me if it's in the topological regime or not, you can actually do this easily with a single tone measurement. So this is kind of the resonator shift uh, without a second tone. And um, so there are, okay. So these are two different samples and um, all you need to look for is if in one plaquette of the two currents, okay, these are the two currents we can apply to modulate these split phases, do you have one blob or two blobs? So when you have two blobs, that corresponds to uh, uh, the topological regime. And these correspond really to the two minima, kind of the two minima you have in the Brian zone. Okay, so, um, so, is so this the time is in principle up. Uh, it's up? Yeah. Okay, so let me just finish then. So yes, so I think that it's not as robust because uh, you have some H junk and this H junk will, might be inductances. It could be coupling to quasi-particles. And I think this is something that we wanna look at, but there's lots of stuff to do in these systems, uh, lots of more complicated circuits to look at. First, we need to kind of improve the experiment, remove the quasi-particles and um, uh, I think that, um, yeah, there are many, many other things to do. And eventually, I think, I hope that, you know, eventually get to transport. But again, I think spectroscopy is um, the first step before we 
try to do transport on some of these systems. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so there's a very urgent question, uh, Alfredo. Shall I correct me if I'm wrong? But I think the original proposal from Julie Nazarov was that you can only get topological if you have three independent phases, unless you're dealing with topological superconductors. Uh, I mean, because when you have only two, uh, I mean, these are the total charge number is zero. Um, there's yeah, so we have three because we have the gate charge. So we have the two fluxes and the gate. So in, a, in the multi-terminal circuits, you don't have gate. You just have phases. So you need three phases if you don't have this extra uh, degree of freedom, which is the gate. Total chip number is zero, no? Of the two, uh, you can annihilate these two. Uh, oh, yes, exactly. So uh, that was kind of when, yes. If you, me if you measure the transconductance. That's right. You can annihilate, I mean, in the, the picture I showed you of the spectra, basically in the, in the different limits here, sorry. Um, there we go, yeah. So this, you know, when we go from this to this, we, these, these points merge and then you start opening up a gap. So it's exactly, so this, if you had one more junction, uh, what we call a trisquid, then you could actually merge these two points and then open up the gap continuously. Yeah, thank you. Very nice uh, talk. Um, I have a question about the transport. Um, y you mentioned that you were uh, doing transport experiments because, I mean, spectros spectroscopy is in principle not enough to, uh, to be sure that you have the topological phase. Yes, so, um, so I think that, um, I think that Spectroscopy is a first step, especially in these systems where, you know, we, we think we know everything in the Hamiltonian. I mean, the, with these superconducting circuits, that's the nice part. We can, we can usually do spectroscopy very finely and, and really have nice fits to the model. So here the idea is, okay, let's try to do that in this circuit, which should be topological. You can fit the spectra. You have a model. You can fit to that. And then you can say it's co consistent with a topological model. But then, of course, you have, you have to ask yourself, did I miss, what did I miss in the Hamiltonian? And uh, the thing is, even if you do transport, you, will, you won't have, you know, unless your, all these energy scales that could open up a gap are very small compared to, you know, your quantization, the degree of quantization will also depend on whether it's topological or how topological it is. So I think that's the thing is that uh, it's not like transport Will, will also give you, there's er, sources of error also in transport. It's just that I think with the quantum Hall effect, we've had decades and decades, uh, and it's quite good. I think that in decades, we will also have very good quantum spin Hall insulators and uh, all of these other systems, which are not so robust maybe right now. Uh, okay. This was the first. Uh... Hey. <laughs> So uh, to overcome this problem that you have with low uh, with exciting at very low frequencies, I'm wondering, can't you go um, in the vicinity of your uh, readout resonator and do a two-photon transition, you know, like a sideband? Yeah. So this so usually works in fluxonium qubits. You can you can see the really low frequencies if you do that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, these are this is this is uh, really kind of quite recent, and we really need to develop the, the data more, I mean, to the measurements more, but I think there's lots of things we want to try to be able to probe there. Uh, and at the same time, I don't know, I mean, you have this fundamental limitation with this matrix element, which vanishes. Another question, Takis. Thank you for your talk. Um, in your s eff effective system, you don't really have edge physics. Uh, um, if I'm if I'm uh, I am right, so how can you compare with transport experiments where essentially everything is dominated by H physics? Well, you ex you expect that everything will be dominated by H physics, and uh, it maybe it's some someday uh, non-abelian excitations. Here you don't have that. Yeah. yeah so I think that's uh, 
open, you know, you don't have this surface edge correspondence because you, you know, you, you don't actually put your topologically non-trivial object in contact with something that is trivial, which gives you these interesting edge states. But, uh, you know, if you, like, uh, the, a lot of these phenomena, it's kind of, you, you, you can still see transconductance quantization. So in, the, in this example that I showed you. So the question is, do you, I, I don't think you need an edge, but, but there's probably some interpretation of, you know, this, this edge, bulk edge correspondence that you could somehow figure out. But I, yes, uh, we don't have an edge. You can consider maybe putting, you know, but we can tune in this tri-squid. We, we could tune between the two regimes. And then the question is in the critical regime, is there something? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I mean, let me note that in the quantum Hall effect, of course, also you have the topological arguments, which does not, for the quantization, which does not rely on edge states, right? It just... And this is similar here. And, and I think it's an open question. We, we keep discussing this, what uh, the bound uh, about edge uh, correspondence here in this kind of systems. Uh, it's kind of open. Okay, yeah, Nico. Yeah, I have a couple of questions, but maybe I'll start with the one that's most interesting. So did I understand correctly that the bi squid is just like a stepping stone and then the sort of the, the, the other device for the char charge quantization is then the one that you're heading for, which is not exactly the bi squid or tri squid, but it's more complicated? Or are you planning to use the bi squid somehow in another way, uh, employing the topology to get uh, quantized charge pumping? So, so. Frankly, I think it's important to understand why these things are, are not, you know, why aren't they robust? So I don't think we've understand, we don't understand that exactly. I mean, I think, for example, if you, let's say, I mean, we can go one step further, add some junk terms, and then try to say, we have a small gap, what is the, how, how well will we, we be quantized? Okay, so, I mean, w these systems we know very well. We, we know the Hamiltonians very well. We can add all the parameters, and then we can say, like, okay, if I have this, I know how my spectrum will change, and I can also calculate how my, what, my, what I would expect for, tr say, transconductance quantization or charge pumping. And so then just to, to see some idea, if, uh, to get some idea of the spectroscopy, what could be the possible size of the gap, and then say what could be the, the size of, you know, the... The, okay. The, how well yeah. it's quantized. Uh, what about the, uh, it seems that you are in uh, charging regime, at least mm -hmm. when you go to low EJ, you know, you will be in the charging mm -hmm. regime. Is there like a, is there a way, uh, is there a way to uh, use it in the charge sort of quantization experiment uh, device where you would be not in the charging regime, but somehow all the time dominated by EJ, but still have like, you know, going around these topological points, for example, but not going into the points themselves. Yeah, so there's some, um, you know, th uh, this is my, my student came up with this make charge pumping great again. But so if you have, the bi squid is dual to the Cooper pair pump. If you, it's a dual graph, the circuit. So you can do charge pumping with the bi squid and there are some advantages. Okay, and, and indeed these, these cars, you, know, you, you, you can put yourself, I mean, you don't need to, here we're looking at spectroscopy, so we're always around NG equals 0 0.5. But you know, for, for some of these uh, transport experiments, I mean, it's a, it's a different story where you want to kind of sweep some plane in the phase space that will go through you know, NG equals five or through pi in the phases. I don't know if that- Yeah, you didn't quite uh, <laughs> answer the question. The question Sorry, was that, uh, can you, in, for example, in this device or another device, have this quantized charge pumping or quantized charge current in a regime where e EC is, let's say, always negligible compared to the EJ, instantaneous oh. EJ of the system, so that you would not be so, you know, uh, yeah. sus susceptible to charge this person. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, we have some margin on EC, EJ, but you can't go like a factor 10. I mean, yes, I mean, it's, you, you, won't, you won't be, it'll be quite difficult because then your, your gaps get small. I mean, you, you can, um, you, you have problems with adiabaticity. In the, in the limit, like as you would with uh, uh, other systems. So I don't know, yeah, I, I, I can't say what would be the best circuit for, uh, with the best EJEC ratio to do charge pumping. All right, so maybe to continue to, to break. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, so I think yeah, uh, it's a more, another urgent question. If not, I, I think there's an announcement by uh, one of the organizers, but let's first thank uh, uh, for the talk. Yeah, there is, there is two practical...